believe it. That's Clone Force 99. This is Wrecker, Hunter, Echo, Tech, and Crosshair. Obviously, we are different. We're all you're getting. Ha! We're all you need! They call themselves the Bad Batch. Experimental Unit Clone Force 99. The defective clones with the uh, desirable mutations. This is one meeting I don't want to miss. And welcome to another edition of the Dad Batch Podcast, episode Docking Bay 94. My name is Stevie Kicks, and I am one of your hosts today. And of course, with us as always, the other Dad Batchers, your space daddies. First up, he's, he's, I don't have an intro for Brian. Cool. You don't need one. That's hey, enough. There. How you doing, Brian? <laughs> All right, hold cool. on. When he's not cutting branches in his backyard. When he can't buy peanuts, because there are no peanuts. When he's not driving eight hours a day to get to a one meeting. When he's not going to fix a flat in in, in whatever city, state. When he's busy not about. actually catching a deer. When he's not shooting arrows at not deer. Damn. <laughs> when he's hitting almost bullseyes, but he just had one too many drinks. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Brian Cook. How are you, man? <laughs> hey. Hey. Delicious. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. I'm here. How was your week, man? Uh, uh, the week has been, I've been busy. And it was holiday week. Happy Memorial Day to everybody. Oh, yes. Got out How on was the lake. Memorial Day? Weather man. was nice. Got out on the lake. Did some jujitsu. It was a good day. Awesome. Yep. Nice. Everybody was kung fu fighting. Next up, specialty costume manufacturer, painter, and footy player. Hmm. It's Alpha Rodriguez. Footy. John Ignition. Football. I'm also a, a background actor. Oh. Which is what I've been doing a lot of lately. Which is why... You've been busy, dude. Yeah, I've but... been busy, been busy. Yeah, um, days, I mean, you've been yeah. you've been sending us photos every day of your breakfast because they do provide. Yeah, food, dude, so. Can- you know, catering the, breakfast on biscuits set is and gravy. B and G day, biscuits, man. Biscuits and gravy, bacon, eggs. Sometimes they have eggs Benedict stations. They have like all sorts of. It's insane. Like, do they have any sizzling? Remember sizzling? It was like gig. not quite meat. It's a nice what? part of that gig is you get fed. Yeah, you get fed pretty well. Yeah, um, and also, uh, I this weekend I had some some buddies over. Ramy, David Ness. Shout out to Julio Metalorian. He actually played in my footy game with me. What? And and, and he did really well. Uh, not surprisingly, but it, it was just funny. Uh, it, I was talking to some guys about it this morning when I played, and they're Why like, "Oh, that's surprising." <laughs> Well, cause we've never played together, but I was kind of telling him like, oh. "I hope you're, I hope you're pretty good, because these guys will get on you about it. Like they'll, they might cuss you out. Like you're don't like, worry, <laughs> you're all don't yeah, worry. I'm like, don't worry, his, everything his is cool. Like, tall. Like, hey, like, no one's, no one's gonna fight you. Don't worry. I'm just, it, Holmes, not here. We don't do that here, Holmes. Yeah, his yeah. socks I mean, go up to his knees. You never know. No, but he did really well. Uh, but it was fun. The, after the game, everyone kind of came over to the garage, and we were doing some hell diver stuff, and um, yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Oh, dee, 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 dee. Yeah. Next up, That's this it. is my partner, Bert the Billowy Bear. But you nope. can call him Remy Shanaday. How are you, man? <laughs> I'm I'm good. Bert How are McGirt. you? Bert the Bear. Bert. If I'm Bert, does that make you Ernie, Steven? Ernie. No. no. Does that make you a couple? I said Bert the Billowy Bear, not the Sesame oh. Street guy. <laughs> okay. oh. Ernie. Short attention span. I'd already forgotten that part. What's up, man? How, how's your week been? I'm good. I'm good. So, do anything cool this weekend? Oh my gosh, uh, the weekend's a blur. Um, <laughs> I was at John's house on 
what was it sunday sunday yeah sunday 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 mm-hmm. doing the hell on saturday day. On, on saturday i went to john's daughter's birthday party that was fun oh that's right saturday that's right. we had that yeah i was like, i couldn't birthday. i couldn't come so we do the our one of our largest events in southern california is the uh it's this library event and it used to be out in rancho cucamonga and then it, it moved to be it's now, yeah it's now it's at the upland library and last year it was a little rough because it was their first year having moved it and after covid right. and all that um but this year it was noticeably back heading in the direction back towards its original grandeur i'm nice. excited i was oh. i was worried we were going to lose that one but after this weekend um i can tell i mean and a lot of our friends that are in the uh kind of the background community were there um so roy ross um Dan- daniel was there daniel romero so they were there doing autographs and stuff very cool right on. yeah i didn't realize that that was that troop that you were doing was the actual star Wars reads event. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if on our forums, it still reads the same like title and everything because it's, it's now at the Upland public library instead of Albiani, which is what we're also used to having read for all those years. Yeah. We would do it, but same people. So the folks that work, the folks that coordinated with us for that, that worked at the Rancho Cucamonga library now work at the Upland one. Oh, nice. That Paul Biani event was, uh, I remember for years it was, a good thing. I just remember did... Billy D. Williams. What yeah. do we have here? I was gonna say, I think that's where I met you, Brian. You and Tori, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I think I at like one at, at one moment we had 150 troopers signed up for that event, uh, combined <laughs> within different shifts and everything. But it was oh, yeah. a big one. Yeah, it's second only to the Hollywood Christmas Parade as far as the number of members that will get out for an event. Mm-hmm. We had a massive awesome. changing area. It was like the whole upstairs. That was rad. Yeah. Not quite, not quite that grand at this one, but it's adequate. It's good. I don't do. And last but not least, he's the two part epoxy of our little squad. 24 hours to set, but extremely hard. (laughs) It's Joe Lara. (laughs) Wow. Wow. (laughs) That was in reference to your muscles because you swole. Not, not flattening. Not flattening. What's up, Joe? How are you, man? Doing well, man. It was good. Doing well. My, uh, it's always a sad day when the boys leave because they'll come for for a moment of time. Oh, you get reconnected, and then they leave and break your heart. That's what kids do. They leave and break your heart. But they're supposed to. They're supposed to do great things. Um, but yeah. So we spent time with the kiddo before he took off. He ha- he has to do a cruise, so he's gonna he's gonna sail from the Bay Area to Hawaii hit japan then hit korea dude he's it's pretty cool man so he he uh he got some cash he went to one of those exchanges uh get some get some yen a little early and plan for that and we had to get him some supplies that kind of stuff just being a dad man in a different stage toothpaste and, and you so, need you need a passport, right for, for huh? obviously to, to, you need a passport do you, need, you don't need a passport to be on the boat but to get off the boat in a different country you do obviously right he has a passport or, but they also have like uh they have like all these different um not certifications but almost it's like a twit card it's kind of like the similar of like a tsa type like thing. an id type thing an id it's already he's already had a background check and all that stuff but yes he does have a passport yeah cool yeah he's a citizen of the world never thought about that right yeah, taking a boat to Japan rather than flying. Yep, highwayman. Yep, yep. Sing with Chris Christopherson and Willie Nelson soon. Guys, Always I've been um, I've been literally in dad mode since this weekend. My my built in babysitting. My mom has been on a vacation out of town. So oh. since Saturday, it's literally just today is what Wednesday. Mm-hmm. On, since Saturday, it's been me and the boys. That's nice. It. It's me, hundred percent dad mode, doing all the dad things, yeah, not paying totally attention to the group yeah. chats or, or the internet, not having any time to do anything I want to do. With Hearing tears. your name, Dad, repeated oh. a million times dad. in one hour. Dad, dad. 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 hey, Dad, dad. Daddy, dad. No. Uh, hey, Dad, look at this. Watch I'm, this. I'm going through the opposite right now because for while while my sister, well, my sister, while my wife's sister was in town. They would go off on the weekends, and I would be like you, where I was with my with my daughter the whole time. But now they all went to Brazil, so I'm like home alone with like the two dogs and the cat, 
Party at John's. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ramy's like, I'm on my way. Yeah, yeah he's like, way. he's already running out the door. Right, dude. I gotta say, I gotta <laughs> say, at, at your daughter's birthday party, yeah. it was such a pleasure meeting your mother. Oh, yeah, that was the first time like, I met her. Yeah, because it was so funny. Because you were like, you were like, mom, let me introduce you to my friend. This is Stevie, and then she was like, yeah. I know. I see him everywhere on all the things that you do. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm like the Bad Batch guy. She's like, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, she's cool. He's a sweetheart. She's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Oh, um, anybody uh, watch anything this week? Oh, you know what? Mm-hmm. I- I'm going to say this one thing. Uh, I've been on an Amazon kick lately. There's a lot of old anime and a lot of older uh, things on there that they're like little gems that people are, if you're not looking for it, you don't you know it's it. there. Yeah. Or you don't, you might not. Yeah. You might even find. So uh, when I watched an old anime, I watched it and I finished it. You know, at the end of something, it, it recommends similar titles, whatever. So it recommended this, this anime called wicked city. If you look on Amazon uh, prime, Ooh. it's called wicked city. Don't look at it. it, it not around kids. Not around any, not even, it, it's, it's an anime essentially, but like, like, like rated R there, there's some, some, some elements to it, but I was watching this. I'm like, holy crap. Like it, not only is it really good. It's from, it's from 93. Oh, wow. Um, and it still 90, holds. It, dude. It's amazing. And, it's still and, I'm not, and I'm not saying because of the R rated stuff, it, that stuff was a shock. I was like, oh, wow. I didn't expect that, you know, whatever. But, um, it was really good surprisingly. So. If you have time, go check out Wicked City. Not with your kids, though. It is very adult themed. That's on Amazon Prime. Yeah, yeah. Pretty. I watched, I watched a horrible movie that I don't even want to bring up, but I did watch my daughter graduate high school on Saturday. Congratulations, oh, Levi! Big milestone. Wow. Omega is educated and is educated. Big milestone. Two and a half months, she'll be off at college. Sad, dude. That oh, they break your you heart. Know, man. Oh, I was dude. when I was when you had sent us that her graduation photo, and I started looking at old pictures of of the squad. Man, I I was looking at like old photos of of our season one to season two Bad Batch costumes and yeah. just how like how Levi dressed as Omega. And you know she's always next to you because you're her dad. But and then your crosshair, and it was just like it was crazy how art imitated life in that moment. Because like because yeah. in London you guys were just like yeah. inseparable, and like literally that's how the show plays out. And I was just yeah. like, oh, it couldn't be, be any more perfect. Yeah. They were watching. They were watching. Yeah. They do. They were paying attention. Omega's tears. And now you've got to let her go and fight her own rebellion yeah. oh no she's oh. taking off they need pilots it's Boo. So Boo. They need pilots. yeah that's far better than the stupid movie that i watched so <laughs> yeah I, I got my uh got my son to watch a bunch of john wick so he's caught up we just actually know we need to watch yeah. john wick four we haven't seen four oh yet. dude four is the best about, uh four, four. hours you need a. It's long. It's that long. The bathroom. It's not, it's not that long. It's not that long. It's. Well, dude, I mean, it's, the first like, it's like two and a half. So it's like two and a half. It's close a solid to three. three hours. Yeah. It's, so we gotta watch the. Four. It's really good. You Donnie, it's Gatorade. Number bottle. four. Number four is so good that Donnie Yen is getting his own spin off. Getting his own spin off, dude. Yeah, his character. Oh, wow. Is so good. Yeah. Four. And, and I'm gonna say. Is amazing. Donnie Yen is amazing. It is a good. 20, 30 minutes too long. <laughs> It there's a lot of there's a bit extra. The stair it, scene. Well, at least, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, hey, him rolling down the it, stairs. I mean, when you look at three. Was it? <laughs> it what was that so three hundred assassin? What was that Japanese movie with three hundred? <laughs> oh, yeah, like that was ridiculous. So, as long as it was, doesn't hit that level, I think it was two like hours that. too long. <laughs> no, you're not seeing the same person come back. Like you're all that guy just died. <laughs> Dude, that, that movie was ridiculous, man. You die and fall off screen and we come need, back. We need to add that movie. Great. We need to add that movie to our um um commentary tracks. Oh, oh god. You <laughs> oh, gotta record those, by the amazing. way. Yeah. Um Gosh. I finished I finished Shogun a couple days ago. Oh, I still need to Season finish one of Shogun. I finished it and, so long ago I forgot. I got two more episodes, three more episodes. Those final two episodes. 
I mean, good. <laughs> Oof, dude. Rough. The, the 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 bombshell that happens in the second to last episode, and then the final episode. Actually, no, I won't even say that. The last three episodes. So so eight, nine, ten. I mean, well, there was parts I where I was like, there were moments. Yeah, there were moments where I was literally like covering my face. Like I was watching it alone at night, and I was I was covering my face in angst. And then I'm I'm not ashamed to say that you know there was some there was some tears and everything by the by the end of the series. And wow, that is just it was such a, a such a beautiful um, way to tell a story. Like it's an awesome show. I didn't. Yeah, like and, the last and I and I know it's a remake, and I know there's people out there who who were. Um, very diehard about the original but man it's just such good beautiful storytelling um and we don't get a lot of that we don't get a lot of that these days costumes are sick man yeah. dude the sets so and good. beautiful welcome to pabu my home away from home here's your drink and enjoy the reunion have surrounding us is more than just this podcast. We found ourselves at the center of an incredibly creative and thriving online community made up of the absolute best fans, makers, creatives, and professionals in the world. And this community feels to us as much like a family as any other flesh and blood relationship that any of us have ever known. That's why we started calling our live events family reunions. We've done several of these live events and we weren't sure we'd ever be able to top the experience we had at Celebration London, which blew our minds at the response we got from the attendees. Until now, the Dad Batch Podcast Family Reunion will be live at the largest international pop culture convention in the world, San Diego Comic Con, on Friday, July 26th, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. in room 7AB. And we'll have a lot more details to share about just what we have planned for this special event in the coming weeks. But we were so excited to share the news with everyone, we couldn't wait and wanted to make sure everyone marks their calendars. Now, Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong, but Room 7AB, like, well, first off, Friday is Star Wars Day, right? Like, all the Star Wars stuff is on Friday. Now, we had been told that all the podcasts were going to be done in the library at an off-site location, so that, I mean, which is cool. It's still part of the con, but it wasn't inside the convention center walls. And then we got our email, and we're actually on Star Wars Day, the Friday. And isn't Room 7AB where all the other Star Wars content is, like Hasbro you, and Sideshow? You are, not, you are not wrong. I have been... I have been queuing up to room 7AB on Fridays, on San Diego Comic-Con Fridays, for decades. <laughs> and it is every Friday of Comic-Con at San Diego is, is Star Wars Day. It's, it's the unofficial, quote-unquote, Star Wars Day. And Lucasfilm books out that room the entire day. So every panel in there is um, pretty much if you're a license holder. To, to star wars you're in that room for an hour um i mean you and i have been in that every hasbro panel since you know since oh, forever we haven't missed one yeah and uh i mean for them to put us in that room whew, i'm just I'm, yeah. I'm like i'm actually uh jittery right now just talking we, about it <laughs> we got the email the other day and uh, we in our group chat i think we were just all a little bit in shock once especially once we sort of pieced together the date and the room and everything like what was it you looked it up what was in the room what was in that room in that same time slot last year the making of andor <laughs> yeah and it had like the creators and, that's like, it cast. really yeah <laughs> just a little thing called the making it yeah so again um we're going to be live at san diego comic-con which is crazy on friday july 26th from 6 p.m to 7 p.m in room 7AB. And then right after that, we're all going to go over to Mosh Isley and partay. Yes. Don't, Straight over. And, yeah. and if you're going to be at Comic-Con, if you're going to be at Comic-Con on that Friday, oh my God, you could probably secure a good seat into our panel if you attend the panel before that. Because oh. there's somebody, somebody on this podcast that's going to have their own panel too oh, right there right. right before 
it's not my panel. It's the well, level mean, first. It's the legions. You know the the garrison's panel. But yeah, it's the five. Yeah. It's the five hundred and first legions panel. Yeah. Um, at, from from five to six. Mm-hmm. But I heard I heard that one of the panelists on there might be might be you, Joe. Is that? Is, yeah. Am I hearing that right? Yeah, I'll be there. I'll I'll throw out, I'll throw out uh, some snacks to the crowd if you show up a little early. <laughs> Sounds yeah. good. Yeah, so Joe's gonna go five. back to back. He's got panels yeah. back to back. That's what I did last year, man. Last year we had the panel and then went over to Mosh, but now we got squeezed in in between, so it's kind of cool. It's gonna yeah. be at least three hours, and that's only three hours oh. of a real long week. Right. Joe, yeah. <laughs> Joe will have something special for anyone who shows up for the five hundred first panel wearing a Dad Batch T-shirt. Mm. <laughs> I love these promises that just kind of happen. <laughs> Raymond's in got the moment. you covered. We've got plans. We've got all kinds of crazy plans. It's gonna be we do. Joe's we... gonna Joe's gonna be giving out helmets it. at his panel. Don't say it, Steven. No. <laughs> no, maybe maybe not that. But that Steven's gonna ship internationally. <laughs> I I didn't put it in my notes here, but but we're gonna throw it out there. We want to we want that Friday. It's not just Star Wars Day. We want it, we're taking over and we're making it bad batch day specifically Ooh. we want as many bad batch costumers and bad batch fans as we can get into that convention center on friday july 26th we want to show we... lucasfilm just how much the community loved that show yep it's, what are it's we sort of like doing? it's sort of like that... the last hurrah right it's probably the last time we're going to be together wearing wearing bad batch bad for bad a minute batch. that's for sure yeah. never say never but for a minute it's well, gonna be a while yeah we, we will be off. We will be full Bad Batch season on one. Friday. Oh, season, season one, one Bad Batch and Friday. Not for the nope. panel because we can't Without sit down. Reunion. But earlier no, in the day, no. all five of us will be in our Bad Batch season one yeah. suits. We've got. We should probably. Special. You guys want to hang out at the Heroes and Villains booth and take some photos yeah. there? I think we have yeah. to. So we'll have a lot more to talk about between now and then. I think every week there'll be something different. Yep. Lots. Highway to the Danger Zone. Right after, right after um, our panel, we're gonna be heading directly straight over to Mosh Isley, okay, which is which is a music box, and I think tickets are still on sale. They are. I just saw a post for it. Join us at Mosh Isley. Yeah, shout out to uh, the Think the Maker family uh, yeah. for always throwing such a great little shindig that that they're always gracious enough to invite us to and and have us sometimes participate in um so that's a good it's a good invite like and i would say like don't worry about if you're into the music or not it's just a great environment it's fun. It's, it's, it's friends it's just, you it, like star wars yes yeah you're everyone's in the same headspace everyone's just trying to have fun and and be you know and, and everyone's having whatever i guess having fun and i think yeah. there's drinks and, and it's like a concert but you're there with the bass player of story of the year the guitarist and singer of yellow card sing along right i mean of, yeah, it's like yeah, sing along. I mean, we're all singing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we're gonna be there. We're gonna be there. We'll we'll, we'll be there too. Sure. We're gonna be there with we're Nicholas. Is there, is there a theme? Is there a theme this year, the, no. this year for the for the Mosh Eyes? Wasn't it uh Wasn't it a uh, pilots? Uh, Rebel pilots or pilots or something? I think. Uh, I I I don't. It's interesting. I don't know that they've actually officially said it, but I think if anybody showed up with some kind of pilot related, I mean, if you look at their, on, if you look it would at make. Their, Poster. Did it make a lot of sense? The and then it, it being San Diego, close to Miramar, where Top Gun was wow. filmed. I know. And I mean, our, oh, and our, right. and our theme song for the family reunion being mm-hmm. Highway to the Danger Zone. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, or they just kind of connect. Mm-hmm. Right. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Maybe. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm a naval aviator. <laughs> Talk to me, ghosts. Durk, durk. Thanks, Brian. Now we've just been fined ten thousand uh, <laughs> dollars. Really? Thank you again, everybody, for tuning in. If you'd like to show your support for the show, pick up your brand new Space Daddy and Space Mom Echo shirts and stickers at thedadbatch.com. Your support directly goes to making this show possible. We're being hailed. This encryption's new. This might take a while. Okay, so um, the Ronald Reagan Library, which is here in, in Southern California, from March 15th through September 8th, they're hosting an exhibit titled Star Wars SDI Defending America and the Galaxy. Mm. Um, 
Let me pull this thing up. It's actually looks pretty cool. I meant to have this ready. Pull it up. I'm working on it. And then uh, enhance our, our evening was a little frazzled earlier. Enhance. 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 There we go. Okay. Enhance. So, <laughs> um, as you can see, so at the, at the Ronald Reagan Liger, the, so for anybody that remembers, um, back in the eighties when Ronald Reagan announced kind of the, his space defense initiative, it was, he called it, it was the vernacular called it star Wars and it was timely because star Wars had just come out, but they're doing this event and they're actually going to have some live props and in they're they're embracing the star Wars branding that was used for that whole military initiative and incorporating star actual star Wars into this event at the library. So, um, it, there's some stuff going on. The exhibit's sponsored by Prop Store and AV Masters. Um, you can get tickets if you go to reaganfoundation.org. Um, there's you can get tickets to the event. Um, there are some special timed events. I think on June 15th and July 20th, um, there's some special um, luncheons and and panel presentations that are going on, um, as well as there's a, a free event on August 1st. Um, but again, for that whole duration between those dates, you can go to the museum and get in and check out this exhibit. Congratulations wow. to the maker himself, George Lucas, who was awarded the honorary Palme d'Or award presented to him by a longtime friend, Francis Ford Coppola. Wow. Among the many kind words spoken by Coppola at the presentation speech, he had this to say about his friend, George. He said, I also remember George when he returned so sad and rejected, having gone to the owners of Flash Gordon, the protagonist of a space comic book in 1934, that they said he wasn't important enough to trust with their family's character, the star of the serial movies he used to watch as a kid. He looked at me and he said, well, I guess I'll just make my own movie. I'll call it Star Battles or Star Wars or something like that. <laughs> so, he, so he did. And in the process, risked everything he had to make it. Congratulations, George. Not only am I your friend, proud of you, but the world world is here, proud to honor you. So congratulations. To Way to go, Georgie. To the That's notorious awesome. GL. Yeah. Did, you guys, did you guys see the... Did you guys see the videos that were going around of these two guys, uh, Coppola and Lucas, like holding hands afterwards when they were having like their, their like little get together with all the other directors and just friends they haven't seen in a while? No, because mm -mm. well, because um, you know they're what in their eighties now, I believe. Yeah. They're up there, and, uh, and Coppola's I, I believe Coppola's wife passed uh, back mm -hmm. in April. And so this is like, I think this is one of the first times that they've seen each other since then. But then I was just like, man, it's so wholesome. Like seeing them, they're just sitting Friends. there chatting amongst themselves. Buddy, and he's just, yeah. yeah. And I was just like, man, friendship. yeah. Like I would, like if we were in our eighties, I'd probably hold one of your hands. I think maybe. I'm not I, sure. think I'll, I think I'll be dead though when you're in your eighties. Cause I'll be like 90, <laughs> which is basically 90. That's it. Oh, yeah. 90. Well, only 90? I'm like 10 years older than you. Oh, my grandma, my grandma just turned 97. 97? Wow. She's from two generations before me. 97? Yeah, yeah dude. Wow. She's, she's kicking. No I don't want to be 90, dude. Like At 80, I'm calling it. I'm yeah. calling it. <laughs> you're calling it. Calling We're not it. letting you, dude. Don't you're gonna take 99. you're gonna take you're gonna take a stake and go out in a rowboat and you're just gonna jump overboard and let the sharks get you, huh, Joe? <laughs> I'm gonna find a shark and punch it in its claspers. Just fight it. <laughs> Joe's gonna get up on tall on the top of a tall building and just oh dang. Joe wants Joe wants to get taken out by a shark. So yeah, oh, shark is epic, man. Yeah, 80 call it. Sharp, sharp, Where did we ever followed orders? I never we haven't followed orders. Take this shock. Okay. So pretty much the rest of the news is act like go figure, considering that it comes out next week. Oh, does so, it? According to a report from the New York Times that we cool. actually have the budget numbers for production of Acolyte, which clocked in at $180 million for the eight-episode season, bringing the per-episode total to $22.5 million each. Whoa. So just for comparison, we know that Skeleton Crew's budget was $136 million, um, but we don't know the number of episodes yet, so we can't break that down to a per-episode. I, I had actually heard it was six, so we'll see. <sighs> Um, and or season one clocked in at the most expensive show to date at 250 million, although there was 12 episodes there. So it actually puts its per episode cost at 21 million, which is just shy of what Acolyte is for, for its eight. Um, tangentially, the same 
New York Times report also confirmed that the iconic phrases, I have a bad feeling about this, and may the force be with you, will make an appearance in the show. So for anybody that was concerned that that might not make it. Um, we've got character posters for several of the main cast. So first up, we've got uh, May, Amanda Stenberg's character, a mysterious young woman with a tragic past. May gets swept up into a sinister mystery, one that puts her into the center of a conflict in unexpected ways. She is determined to exact vengeance on those who wronged her, and little can stop May on her quest. Next up is uh, Lee Jung Jae's Master Soul, who is a wise, highly respected Jedi Master, strong in the ways of the Force, still and stalwart. Soul has a deep sense of compassion and will defend those who cannot defend themselves. He is a powerful warrior with intense emotions that he uses to his Jedi training, uses his Jedi training to balance. You know, I, I think he's going to be my favorite. Um, I mean, I, I wasn't one of the, I haven't seen any of the episodes yet, but I think he's going to be my favorite because I saw one of those um, junk junket press junket interviews and they asked, mm -hmm. they asked him uh, uh, which Jedi does he think he's the most like and he was he was saying that he's most like um qui-gon jinn i was like ooh, that's a i mean it's not a deep cut but man like that's a, that that's a good jedi to be like yeah yeah he's my, yeah he's my favorite dude qui-gon qui-gon's a g he wasn't yep. stuck on the capital g on the rules i have a very particular set of skills <laughs> <laughs> um so next up Carrie Ann Moss's character, Master Indara, is a Jedi Master of great physical and mental skill. She has exacting control of her Force abilities, exuding a sense of command and authority with just her presence. Though she does not seek combat, she is skilled enough to engage on her own terms. Her, uh, so, a uh, tangent, we may or may not get, get to it on the show, but um, so on the, the this upcoming, so we dropped another episode of Off the Rack Rebellion, so everybody go check that out if you haven't already. Um, but also this next upcoming one is a trailer breakdown for the costume scene in the trailer for Acolyte. Mm. And, uh, and and Kate and Billy spent quite a bit of time talking about her robes because they're they're definitely unique compared to a lot of the oh, ones. Oh, yeah, that's seen. right. They are. She yeah. also knows Kung Fu. For the record. Correct. Yep. Correct. Is her lightsaber made of the Matrix? What? Oh, <laughs> uh, man. I want to say it is a lime green. Why she has green. Just saying. That'd be sick. I, I follow the rap. There's That's true in my head canon from now on. She takes her robe off and she just has a full black latex outfit. On. <laughs> she puts on the sunglasses. Like, <laughs> Walking on walls. Starts doing Jedi moves. Walking on walls. Okay, next up. Uh, Kill Naka. Uh, played by Junus Sumato. Or Suotamo, oh, sorry. Man. Uh, a Wookiee Jedi Master, Kelnaka, has sequestered himself in the tangled jungles of Kofar. He is a loner who lives a solitary life. His top knot just kills me. Dude. I know. <laughs> just, uh, it makes it like head head. very weird. I understand the point of it, but it just makes him look like a conehead. <laughs> yeah. It's um, a nubbin. A nubbin. <laughs> Looks like he got hit in the head with a hammer. It's a top knot, though, right? It's a, it's a top knot. I think knot? that's what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Okay. Which is man cool. bun, right? Or a cool. wookie, wookie bun. Uh, Jackie Lon, played by Daphne Keene, skilled and studious Padawan learner. Jackie Lon shows great promise in her path to becoming a Jedi Knight. The Padawan apprentice to Master Soul is young, but she proje projects calm and conducts herself with maturity. She's got a cool look. I like yeah. that. Do the, yeah. Are those horns? That looks and her saber's bad. the same color as. Uh... She's Trinity. in the Matrix characters too. Yeah, Trinity. she's in the Matrix too. She knows karate. She's in the Matrix too. She has a Padawan uh, thing on the bobber, wow, right? Wow. She does have braid. the braid. Yeah. Oh, did she? Ha does she have the Padawan braid? Let's Looks see. Looks like it. Oh yeah, she does. There it is. Mm -hmm. There it is. Unless that's yeah. her style. Unless it's her hair, right? Nah, <laughs> there's no accidents in Star Wars. I'm sure. Yeah, too. that's that's. Good Padawan. Yeah, literally Good says the job. Padawan apprentice to Master Soul. Oh, there yeah. you go. Oh, literally confirmed. So. confirmed. You heard it here first on the Dad Batch podcast. I mean, I, I did just read it a minute ago too. I'm just <laughs> I just didn't even see that. I just, That's next week. Next week. Next right? Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Amanda Stenberg did an interview with Good Morning America and said that the show drops fans in the midst of a murder spree <laughs> as Jedi begin turning up dead and the mystery surrounding twin sisters Osha and May. Both played by Amanda Stenberg begins to unravel. 
Both. So Both. we've seen we've seen May, and are. that was a, that was a name that we were told, and we've seen the trailers. And there's and Amanda Stenberg's character we thought was character singular my, uh, my own definitely mother. had two different distinct looks, but now. Mm. We know that that is actually two separate characters. Twin sisters played both played by Amandla. Um, and and I, I, it's funny. I don't, she said this on good morning America. And yet I don't think I've seen this all like, I, like written anywhere. Right. I haven't seen up. it all over the place. You'd think that that would have blown up, but, but look at the image. Yeah. And, yeah. And yes, and yes, exactly. Look at the image. That's both of her different separate characters. And that's the, like her hair is different shades. Yeah, totally. one's lighter, one's totally darker. different. Yep. One has a COVID mask, the other one, one has a COVID <laughs> yeah, mask. Yeah, exactly. One and that's she's and that's why she's on the, the post. COVID party. mask is a bad, it's, the bad because it's actually two separate characters. So, mm. um, wow. so at the heart of the acolyte are Osha and May, whom Stenberg describes as having been separated by tragedy when they were very young. Osha joined the Jedi Order and studied under Master Soul, only to end up leaving because she has so much internal turmoil that she's not able to connect with the Force in a, in the way that maybe she was destined to. May, who everyone thought was dead, is actually alive, and she's on a warpath. The bodies, 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 actress continued. Um, also, part of the same interview, we learned that um, a little bit about Joni Turner Smith's character, Mother Anasea, so she, you see her in the front foreground of the picture here, who's described as the leader of a coven of force witches. She's a fierce protector and leader, and she's striving to create an environment of safety, not only for her children, but for her family. And then Leslie Headland chimed in and said, so the power of one, the power of two, and the power of many is a little bit about what Mother Anasea's hope or the legacy is. The Jedi are a power of many. That's what they are. Mother Anasea is the power of one, while the twins are the power of two. Hmm. That's interesting that her 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 name is Mother, like Mother Talzin. Yeah. And that was the first time I'd also seen Mother used in conjunction with her name. I'd seen the name Anasea before, but I hadn't caught the word Mother yet. Um, Lucasfilm has also announced that they're doing a run of the first two episodes of Acolyte in theaters a day early on June 3rd. Um, if you want, you can go check out Star Wars Instagram account and one of the top posts there, if you if, Basically, if you go to their bio and hit the links, um, you can click over and it takes you to a Fandango site where you can um, submit your interest to attend. I don't know how they're selecting people, if it's first come, first serve, or if it's just a lottery or what. But if, and there are theaters all over the place, you know, there's a drop down with different states and the theaters in each state. So um, you might have an opportunity uh, if you're available to go see Acolyte in theaters a day early. So, and then for everybody else, don't forget, Acolyte will be streaming starting next Tuesday, June 4th at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on Disney+. Plus. And that is it for the news. Let's, we've got company. You want to sit with us? That's never happened before. He's worked on a broad and diverse range of genre, series, and features from Once Upon a Time, The Expanse and the Boys, to Night at the Museum 3, Percy Jackson, Sea of Monsters, and Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness. But we know him best for his concept, art, direction, and design for Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic. With us in the Marauder today, it's the one, the only, John Gallagher. How are you, sir? Wait a minute. I made an appearance here, and I'm not going to be on YouTube. <laughs> you are. We're just pre-recording tonight instead of going live. So what kind of it'll, rack it is this. It'll, <laughs> it'll still come out. It'll be on. It'll still be on. Yeah. Later. What a bunch of bush leaguers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we are. We, I mean, we have like five people. I really, by the way, guys, I'm really, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, just as I juxtapose that up against what I just said. Um, <laughs> no, I really am. I really am. Uh, thank you so much for for giving me a shout. I'll so, take what we do here. here. There. You could be anywhere in the world right now, but you chose to hang out with us. So that's, you know, when you frame it that way, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a slight schedule. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just so you know. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, the, uh, uh, I guess the reason or the principal reason that you're uh, reaching out is a very exciting one. Uh, one that I was never expecting to have happen. Um, but it did, and it is going to. Uh, there is a uh, auction 
coming up on July 18th uh, for the concept art of Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. It's a big showcase auction. It's a standalone, but so um, they're currently about 70, 75 images in. Uh, and the amount of exhaustive detail and uh, DNA cross-referencing that they're doing for this stuff. Their Star Wars expert is a Star Wars expert, like, like Rain Man expert. And he's making yeah. connections and, and narrative links, like saying, oh, this, this, you know, this part of it here is definitely a connection to this character and it looks like that character. I didn't think about any of this. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try to cultivate a mystique, but I'm shocked and dismayed and overjoyed that there's this level of commitment to uh, work that you know we were just trying to solve problems um, and and fulfill design briefs. I've never been too pretentious about what I do anyway, but it very much you know you're trying to solve uh, a lot of problems and all ongoing streams and make sure they're connected and integrated and they feel uh, of similar conceit but yeah they've done they've done a fantastic job so far and heritage are really marvelous to work with um this is as a direct result too like i had i have about 450 drawings out of thousands they're spread all over the globe i'm sure by this time i know I know Ray and Greg have a bunch. I know James has a bunch. And some of the other artists have theirs too. Um, but I have nowhere near the bulk of it. So I don't have the original five Darth Revan drawings or anything like that. Those were stolen. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, they're long gone. They are long gone somewhere. I do have the rare uh, Darth Revan uh, in pure white, though, which was kind of interesting. That was a direction that we contemplated for a heartbeat. Uh, Whoa. but of that 450 or so, they've, they've since been archived and recorded and connected and bunched in. Some are selling in batches, some are selling in solo pieces. Uh, a lot of character work, monster work, costume work. Uh, there's an equal amount of, of Sith and, uh, Jedi and gray Jedi as well. So there's some, uh, some mm -hmm. of that, some areas, which of course, uh, some were discarded, some were, uh, some were reinvented and given a new coat of paint. Uh, but that's that's happening. It's a direct result, like I said, of um, my best pal Pete Turcott, who runs a comic shop here in Vancouver, in North Vancouver, uh, Big Pete's Collectibles. Check them out, everybody. Um, and he saw the box of art, and he's like what's this like an amber glow right <laughs> he's like <clears throat> what's going on with this this is this is ridiculous i said oh it's some of my kotor stuff i was just gonna maybe put it on a message board and sell it in bulk and he's like oh no you're not we're gonna do something here because he's got he's got a number of uh, good friends over at heritage and i'm a big nepo baby so whatever i can do to <laughs> Uh, get patronage, and I'm happy to take full advantage of a casual connection. Yeah, how about that? Hey, but professionally, this is um, this is uh, certainly uh, it was the first time like working on this game, and I've said it before. I've, I've, you know, this was a chance to complete a circle, so to speak. You know, like uh, it was a mission more than a game. Like when you make. When you make things that were critical to your own self-definition as a young creator, like Star Wars changed my life. I'm sure I've, an entire generation, if you are so inclined to looking to the stars and wondering what if, uh, or if you ever read a comic book, you ever saw a great movie, it's like it, whoever you are and however it touched you, uh, it just changed the course of my life. I didn't know what doing that meant, but I pointed at the screen and said, I'm going to do that. Anyway, the long and short of that, though, is is it was our chance to give back to something that had been that had already given us 
so much as as fledgling creators as younglings just coming up so we really felt like this was something a challenge that collectively um, was unlike any other i mean we love D, &D of course and we cut our teeth with baldur's gate franchise and so on but D, &D was it was fun but it didn't hit us all the same way as star wars did because star wars is an experience obviously as we all were part of it, it was um, theatrical and in in the theater of the mind afterward, of course. So we had the the opportunity to really make a definitive statement with with this game, and we didn't know if it was going to be successful. We didn't know if it was going to land with a thud, but we had a pretty good hunch that we were on some pretty decent. The first the first objective was not to embarrass Star Wars fans or ourselves. We wanted to to capture the essence of the mythology and hopefully we did that to one degree or another seems to be okay like it's still sort of cherished so i'll take being in the cherished category nobody's turned on it like oh we should really examine river knights of the old republic is very problematic you're like <laughs> let me be one to tell you I, I i was one of the people that played the game when it first came out i remember getting it on pc and that game was um for someone that was that was a consumer i i was uh you know this is 20 something years ago um it was uh just as mind-blowing as the ot was because there were these characters that were brand new that had nothing to do with anything that we've ever seen before or read about before or read in the comics before it was brand new and it was like and the concept of something that happened before what we already thought was so long ago, you know, this is like, you know, three, some 3000 years before that, you know, it, 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 it was like, what? And then the characters and, and the whole twist of the game and, and, the, you know, the character design, everything, even like the, 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 the dark Jedi, I, the, I have it. So like ingrained in my head, remember the first mission where you wake up and you're leaving, you know, you, you leave the room to, uh, in that ship and there's dark Jedi fighting a je a, a regular Jedi. I'll never forget that ever my entire life. I, I haven't played the game in a while now, but I, I'll never forget that. There's a bunch of moments like that. The vibral blades, everything. There's there's so many special things. What do you suppose, when, when do you suppose it happened that Star Wars became so risk averse when it's abundantly clear that it is very deep, fertile ground for next level storytelling? in terms of that universe. I think we've had hints. For me personally, Andor was a hint of a direction I would love to see it going in as adult storytelling in. Yes, I understand it's for 12 year olds, George, but the fact is that there is room in any universe for adult storytelling. Where do you think it, it suddenly became not that? Where it just mailed it in let's go to the movie theaters and, <laughs> and, and make timid trash that that avoids anything re remarkably or, or rather not remarkably but uh embraces anything wholly unremarkable well i'll i'll, I'll comment from my point of view because sure. when when i was growing up i grew up in between the films so we we didn't the only films we had that came out were were the prequels that I, by then i was already 16 17 18 um yeah but for for me as a kid a 10 year old you know or you know an 8 year old a 12 year old i, I didn't have any films to to go off of i had the, the original films that came out and then there was nothing else essentially so we had the video games right. we were we were a, the video game generation essentially that that we played super star wars and super empire strikes back and uh, pod racer eventually once that came out and then but i felt like the the prequels were not ours that we were more of the ot but we were also in between you know we, we were kind of as soon as disney bought lucasfilm we at that point people like me were so desperate for any new content because when kotor came out that was 2003 and that was so refreshing it was something new something we could all do and 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 it was kind of cool too because it was you make your own character you become part of the game and um but aside from that there was nothing else uh coming out so w when it got bought we were just happy to get something 
you know, we got Rebels, we we got Clone Wars. There were certain things that were coming out. Um, but I'm not sure, you know, I, I don't know where, when it changed because in my eyes, we were just happy to get something because we were complaining for years and years about no new Star Wars. And then when Disney got them, we were getting new Star Wars, but we were still complaining. <laughs> I well, I think there, I think on, I think there's like a few different things too. And like on the surface, when you look at people's attention spans and entertainment and right, there's like different layers in there of how quick things come out and there's different levels of star Wars fans too, right? There's, there's people that are deeper in grain and there's people that are just more like, Hey, show me a lightsaber and some blasters and, and I'm good. And I think we're getting different, you know, you brought up Andor, like that's a great example. Um, sure. I, I think we're seeing, we're starting to see it balance. It feels like that we're seeing, you know, there's, there's the more commercial and then there's the more advanced. Um, you know, I thought, you know, obviously we're Bad Batch fans, but this last season of Bad Batch was like pretty deep for a cartoon. But, um, um, you know, Andor was a great test and I don't, I'm horrible with like the ratings or what's what, whatever. But, you know, I felt like Andor was a success. So I could see us seeing more of that. But, um, and, and who knows, you know, how much one property got more eyeballs than the other. But, um, you know, I think entertainment is a, in a funky spot right now. And, you know, we have these things to blame for a lot of stuff. And it's just a short attention spans and trying to keep people in, engulfed. And, you know, what the, what are the masses, you know, what, they're trying to make money too. So do you think the future for Star yeah. Wars is necessarily filmed live action? Do you think that the most interesting opportunities to explore a complex narrative, like you mentioned, Bad Batch being pretty deep for a cartoon. I mean, deep narrative yeah. is deep narrative. It doesn't matter if it's yeah. live action. It doesn't have to be live action. But, but I'm curious about that. Perhaps in the future, my speculation is the most interesting uh, explorations in the universe won't be filmed live action. I think that's the great drag behind. That's the long tail of catch up and that the most interesting work that's my speculation is that the most interesting work is to be done in video games, uh, graphic novels, uh, long form narrative. Less and, boundaries. Well, there certainly is because the assumption, well, it's, it looks, looks like it's made for nine year olds. And you're like, Oh, darling, if you only knew, like, right. I think that's the, I think that's the great bait and switch that happens with yeah. uh, what is novel, what it passes as novelty is that you can, in these stylized art forms, create uh, far more provocative content under the auspices of being for 12-year-olds, when in fact it is absolutely not. Like, I'm, I'm curious if that's the case. Like, maybe Star Wars, uh, if you can, given the current regime, who seem to be a lightning rod for, for controversy and, and contempt, which they may or may not deserve, um, I'm, I'm of the opinion that the best place to uh, see Star Wars is in alternate forms of media. That, like, that's so funny that you, that you, that you say that. Cause we, I think, I don't know if it was last week or the or week before, but we were just talking about um, tales of the Sith uh, or I'm sorry, tales of the empire, that new, that new uh, mini series. And, and we were talking about how specifically the, um, the arc about Dathomir, the, the the witches of Dathomir, and how on that planet they open up the scene with Grievous just slaughtering everybody, and he's laughing about it and taunting them to run, and we're just like, it, it's literally the opening scene, Clone Wars animation style, but it's like the most graphic thing <laughs> you've seen in in Star Wars animation, and and I mean, look at who's making those shows. It's it's all the the old school pre Disney storytellers and mm -hmm. yeah, they're the ones that are, you know, they're diving deep in, into those, into those stories. It seems to me you're, I, you're absolutely right. It seems to me that the great acts of subversion are going to occur in plain sight. The, it seems like film entertainment is the most scrutinized and most rigorously debated and the most hotly contested in terms of, you know, is it this or is that? Meanwhile, 
you just kind of leave them alone over there on the margins to make their animated stuff. And you're like, mother, this is intense. Like imagine filming that. You would be you would be dragged behind uh, the bus of of piety uh, or with a rope around your ankles if you tried to do something like that. Like that would that would be absolutely unacceptable. Like no no this isn't how we do things in filmed entertainment. Like somehow that's the highest thing to aspire to. And I I ironically as somebody who works in it, uh, I don't think it's. I don't think it's the thing to aspire to. I I think you can tell a great Star Wars story in five minutes on your phone. Um, it's just a matter of telling that story. And it seems to me that people were gravitating towards uh, the largest appeal storytelling venues perhaps aren't as engaged with really pushing it forward for an audience that's growing you know, as they do in their lives, you grow, evolve, you're exposed to new things, you have interesting new evolutions in your taste. You want Star Wars to keep up with you. And I don't know if the film entertainment uh, space is going to be the one to do that. John, did you watch um, Star Wars Visions season two, Screechers Reach? No, I did not. I didn't watch season two yet. Highly, highly recommend that. I think that was, I think. For all that of was us, my that favorite was, episode. Yep. That was the episode. Is and that it, right? But Screechers Reach, it was it was a 12-minute story, and it was just about these kids on a planet. And I think the one of them goes into a cave. And like for the first few minutes, you're just like, oh, it's just a typical Star Wars story of somebody finding, you know, that they're connected to the force. It's so good. But but by the end of the 12 minutes, you realize that this kid is not connecting go. with the light side of the force they're connecting with the dark side and they're being seduced and this whole time you're just like oh this is this is cool this is like this is how people connect and then that last minute gut drop <laughs> of like, like oh, oh no it's a you were just seduced and you're just like wow like so yeah Steven, uh, absolutely the studio is a it's an irish studio called cartoon saloon okay. well that explains it i mean anyone yes. you know anyone's got an irish last name is up to no damn good that's oh, all right. it's so good the the director was paul young and yes cartoon <laughs> we're, yeah. we're here to upset the apple cart start fist fights <laughs> that's interesting okay well thank you for the recommendation i'll definitely give it a look that um, is probably the best one from that from that whole is that right yeah it's pretty good well, I think I think the it, war stories are interesting when they're told from the perspective of soldiers. War stories aren't entirely, con in particularly provocative, told from the point of view of of generals, stakeholders, and decision makers. I just watched as as an example, because George's primary inspirations were were you know just a mix of of things that he enjoyed coming up as a kid. One of them was war movies, obviously. We all know the stories there. But I watched Masters of the Air uh, on Apple. Tell you what, would that not be a perfect template? I tell, be amazing, right? Like those battles, like those air battles are terrifying. They were amazing, incredible work. Emergent, immersive, scary, with stakes and and fear they're all young kids which is what a rebellion would be it's all the young and disposable yeah. lean into the real world history that, that that george was drawing from and please i encourage you whoever's making stories out there who's ever listening to this ever making their own star wars story go back to the roots of the franchise like i know that that Favreau has has said on, and I believe he's a fan. I just believe his hands are tied as they always are. You have to do one for them, one for him, one for them, one for him. And it's still a losing battle because there's 40 of them and there's one of him. But if you go back to the roots of it and you make this basically the French resistance in the Second World War, you have an overabundance of stories just by tilting your focus ever so slightly away from the fact that it's... See, to me, like Jedi and Sith are like when someone mentions the Vatican. I go, yeah, it's a place. I've been there. But 
as a as as something impacting my life i don't believe that jedi and sith impact the average person's life just trying to get ahead in the in that universe in any way shape or form largely myth gossip rumor innuendo something you hear about you know maybe once in a while you see one like when you see a famous person out of context and you're like wow the jedi is shorter than i was expecting you know like you're to me, that's the kind of real world relationship I would have with that. It's like, oh, you know, I saw LeBron James downtown. Um, but, you know, the the achievements were separate from the person. The person was the living embodiment of those achievements. And you go, oh, neat. In the same way that if you saw a Jedi or a Sith, I mean, Sith, you wouldn't likely see, but Jedi, you saw them walking through a, you know, a market somewhere or whatever. You go, oh, cool. And you leave them alone. You don't run up for an autograph because they're just over there. They're, they're background noise. The real stories are told, you know, people trying to get on with their lives in the face of these overwhelming uh, odds that in all likelihood is going to end badly. You know, like the first time I really felt like in Andor, really felt like the Empire was an occupying army. Like it really felt like they were an occupying force. Yep. And they were going to and their stormtroopers could hit they're relentless and yeah they're unstoppable it's just wave upon yeah. wave upon you it reminded me of like a, a nazi germany situation absolutely absolutely you know because you could see that the spirit of the people is largely broken i mean there were pockets of it's like martial law ish they were done it was over they were shambling off to their inevitable deaths like that to me is the resonance that needs to be a part of this myth and you see it in some of the illustration you see it in some of the the short films you see it in some of the it's on the edges of the stories that they tell and and that's got to be incredibly frustrating for really diehard fans like it's it's just beyond reach you know and uh, i i'm sure it'll come around at some point uh there may be you know a regime change or you know a refocus on telling great stories because Clearly, Disney is in a position where it has to do that. Um, their shareholders are, don't appear to be particularly pleased with the current direction of of their offerings. Star Wars included. Speaking of, speaking of direction, uh, what do you think of the direction we're going in with Acolyte? I don't want it to fail. I really don't. I'm not hoping for yeah. that. I'm not a schadenfreude to do it, but... It's, I'll be the first to, if it absolutely crushes, I'm happy to walk this back. <laughs> we'll have you back on. The... <laughs> no, no, I, I'm, I'm I, I, I have no issue at all yeah. in any way, shape, or form. I, I will go on the record right now that if it turns out to absolutely slay, I will walk back. I will come back on the show and go, I am eating crow <laughs> for, from here on out. It was my misstep and my misunderstanding i was wildly misled by the completely uninspiring garbage that the show's offering the i'm i'm very excited to see it do superb i want people to like here's the thing at some point it's everybody's first show okay I, I appreciate it. but when you are plucked from nowhere and given the keys to the kingdom first of all that's very suspicious and Secondly, are you sure? This is Star Wars, man. Like you're you're going into a pit of vipers here, and the demands are very high and the expectations very low, and that's a dangerous gulf to have between those two things. You need to give that to to, to killers. You need to hand that series to a bunch of killers, and they bring out something absolutely staggering because Star Wars needs a big W right now. It really does. It needs. Several. Yeah, it's hard when you go from really good shows and then other shows, and we all want everything to do well. I mean, we love Star Wars, like you said. We all want things to be awesome. So, and then when I'm, when I'm absolutely stuff, right there. I I want the I want the shine back. You know, and not just for me, but I want it back for the people who are devout. Like I, I wouldn't suggest I'm a hardcore. I'd suggest that I've had hardcore moments in my life, certainly. But I, I want it because I am a, a fan of several different overlapping and intersecting fandoms. I'm not gunning for failure. 
I'm not wired that way. I want this thing to matter to people like it mattered to me when I was 10. And when it's, when it's continually fumbled, even by well-meaning people, I think there's some shining lights, of course, there's some bright moments, there's some wonderful, uh, wonderful experiences, 100%. But, yeah. Uh, That's I why you got to finish the, Bad Batch Season 3, you got to watch <laughs> Vision Season 2. You got to get Tales of the At least we have I lots mean, to pick from, right? You know yeah. what I mean? We, there, maybe there, maybe, uh, maybe we, we make a, a list for John of, like, the <laughs> things, you know, like our, our faves. Yeah, yeah our you, and you know what's so yeah. you know what's so funny, Joe, is everything like the faves are all coming from like like you were saying earlier, animation. Yeah, like, I'm, yeah. I'm so like every time that we get on this talk track of of Star Wars visions, I'm just like this like level of of energy and enthusiasm. I can just feel it growing inside me because and these are these are people who these are studios from around the world who have never been given an opportunity to tell Star Wars story yeah. but they, you can tell that the love is there you know uh, uh behind it um i mean gosh what visions came out two years ago we're still talking about yeah. it because why why do you suppose that there's love care respect and uh and dignity given to the franchise what is it about that they're doing it for the fear for love of it the minute it becomes uh, a flow chart a four quadrant uh, capitalization, you've lost the plot. And that's why I said, if you go back to, and I'm not suggesting this is ever going to happen because it, you know, it only happens in a, a mythological world. But I let me, let me, let me also put an adjacent comment to this, that I don't think that live action is the apex of storytelling. I think it's one of a number of different ways to tell a story. I think, for example, guys, I know guys in comics who are always gunning for the, you know, the Netflix deal and stuff like that. I go, well, why? Money, right? It's okay to say money. It's okay to say there'll be lots mm -hmm. of money. And I'll be able to buy a summer house. Great. Wonderful. But aside from that, is it the best way to share your story? And I think Star Wars has enough uh, lateral uh, and vertical options inside of it that maybe the mistake has been to try to be theatrical in the first place. Maybe the strategic error, the tactical error for the best kind of storytelling is theatrical is not the venue it's going to happen in ever. And why aspire to it? Why release more features in Star Wars? Do we need another Star Wars feature? I'm not sure it needs to happen. Not if, not if fandom, the most demanding elements of fandom are being satisfied by great animation and great comic books. I maintain, here's, here's my example of exactly that. Until you start making adult Star Wars, I wanna see a serial killer Darth Vader movie where he goes around the universe like Jason and he just takes up the last <laughs> land. Jedi. Just call it Order 66, and he just goes around the universe killing the very last of the Jedi. And you only see him, for, he's like the shark in Jaws, you see him for seven minutes. And he's omnipresent, he's terrifying, because he's there all the time. And you make that a 14A film, and it's just Vader crowning all the time. All he does is his, <laughs> his, one, his one minute yes. Rogue One, but he does it for eight Dang. minutes. And we get to see, with the exception of Obi Wan, where we saw him being a, a bamf for <laughs> way too short of a time. Snapping um, next. I need that movie. I need that movie in my life. We've talked about this, John, a little bit on on past episodes, and I think Stephen said it first, and I've kind of paraphrased it, but I think the movies have kind of become, or they are, the the bookends. Um, and and perfect example yeah. is when you look when you look at the original trilogy, and and you know. Leia's putting in uh, the plans into R2-D2 and she's like, Obi-Wan, you fought with my father in the Clone Wars, right? That little Clone Wars, that little tiny phrase. And that was it. And we had to wait how many years before we understood what that even meant. And then we got some movies which kind of set the bookend. And then we got this seven years of, of animation that spilled out what the Clone Wars was. 
who these clones were. We saw a military angle to it. You know, you know, it started yeah. off a little slow, but then it got better and better as it went because that was Filoni really experimenting with storytelling. And uh, and then that led into Rebels, right? And that led into some other really neat content. And then and then we had the prequels, which kind of put the bookend. You know, it, it's kind of like these these. Uh, well, actually, that came out first, and then and then came. The, the this animation but you know what i'm saying it's like these are just bookends they're not really like i guess the moments that we hope that they would be but i think you're right i mean i think a lot of us have talked about vader going ham across the universe would be legit that'd be cool but no you 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 would have a hard time getting that one up the flagpole at disney you'd have to commit acts of larceny because it's first of all it's not a princess <laughs> it's not a princess film right um, but in the same, same way that I thought there were a lot of moments in Rogue One that I, I was absolutely here for, they snuck in like under, under the radar. They're like, oh, there's a cool bit and put that in there. <laughs> Including, of course, why is Darth Vader so terrifying? Oh, that's Here's why. My... And that's <laughs> the first time we really saw anything like that. And we were here for, for it. And that was a visceral powerhouse moment and i'm not suggesting a star wars film has to be full of those but it's very much uh it's an emotional ride and that's what you need to need to pay more attention to and as much as the the princess stories are important it seems to be the only kind of story that disney can tell and star wars as important as a princess was in the skywalker saga uh it isn't the only story to tell in that universe. Like, tell. Let's go back to the old Republic. Like, why is why is that such a anathema? What is it about that that is so terrifying to them? I think they'll come around. I th- I I really do. And I think, you know, when they first when when Disney first picked up the franchise, there was this, you know, there was just this weird aversion to anything prequel anything uh clone wars and it's taken roughly a decade for them to come around and start realizing oh people with money actually do like the prequels they actually do like these things and that's really what's regrettably i mean but it's a, it's, it's a real thing that that's what's opening their eyes is who's who's controlling the money and uh, i actually cool. think that uh you know i think that Totally unrelated to Star Wars, I think that the Deadpool movie, uh, Deadpool Wolverine, is is going to be a really, really important litmus test because this is the first hard R that the Disney Corporation has has produced. Um, and <laughs> I mean, we'll we'll see because you know, like like I just said, money is what opens their eyes <laughs> and their hearts. <laughs> Yeah. John, John, we we could talk hours for this, oh. but uh, <laughs> I want to I want to talk about the most important thing uh, on on the docket tonight, which is the heritage auction on July 18th. Tell us what it's about and 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 where people can see more about it. Yep, you can actually go to uh, ha.com, heritageauction.com. And it will give you uh, effectively live updates of the status of showcase auction. The showcase auction number is 44245. Keep that in mind. Uh, um, but even off the main page, it's really easy just to do a search for it. And it'll give you a, uh, a live update as to where it's at. And uh, we're going to go live on the 18th. There's pre-bidding or preliminary bidding uh, starts I'm not mistaken in, in about 10 12 days thereabouts uh, it's early June uh, there'll be more details on the website and um, I'm uh, I'm really excited to be able to to make sure that this artwork all gets to people who really want to have it in their lives a lot of it a lot of it like I said is stuff's never been seen before. Uh, it's never been a part of the conversation before. Uh, this is all stuff. The Probably one of the most interesting things about it 
uh, at least to my mind, is unlike comics, for example, or painting or illustration, which has always largely been done on, on live media, uh, video games in particular um, started tanking live art about the time we finished this game. So after that, it all sort of migrated over to digital and it all became digital assets. There were no more, there was no more live art uh, being done for certainly majors. I mean, indies, I can't speak mm. with authority on that if it's still to this day is done or not. But uh, in the AAA space, uh, it's just not practical, much like feature films or, or TV series, not practical to, right. to be working uh, right. live art. And this is a finite resource. This is it for for Star Wars art for Knights of the There's no more work. This is this is the the sum total, the the complete inventory, certainly of how, what I have. How many how many pieces do we have in this uh Coming up in this auction. Exact tally, I believe, is somewhere around. Now I can't give you an exact number, but we're around 420, wow. 430. Oh wow! And uh, many will be sold in lots of of three to five, and then a number of them are standalone pieces as well. Well, you had me at auction, so <laughs> Stevie, <laughs> Stevie will be on there. Okay, I have. I, I'm sure a bunch of you guys have have stories about getting getting snipered at, at auctions, but Steven I, has a problem. I've been I've been sniped at auctions more than once where I thought something was mine, including at Heretic. Uh I I was on the hunt a little while ago, just, just a little sidebar here. Um a little while ago I was looking to get a Jack Kirby piece pencil. That's right. So there was a beautiful Jack Kirby sketch, a new god sketch of a uh, you know, some random machine. I always left his machinery. So I was like, that's great. I'll put, and I put a cap in there. I was like, man, I'm going way above my pay grade on this one, but it's mine. I can tell no one's found it. Like somehow I found the one item on heritage auction website, <laughs> which is probably like millions of people go to it. And I found the one Jack Kirby image that nobody's ever seen before. <clears throat> so the fool's paradise I was living in was shattered immediately upon uh, auction day. Because I thought, oh, I'm going to get this thing for like three grand, right? And I was like, yes, finally I get a beautiful piece. Like it was like 12 by 18. It was really a pencil drawing. And yeah, well, that didn't work out. So, <laughs> but in the last 15 minutes, which is when all, all the excitement happens at these auctions, um, you can see a slow grade like this and then it goes stratospheric. But the last 15 minutes, it went from three thousand dollars which i thought was mine in a in a walk to thirty three thousand dollars so and uh, that wasn't that and i had it happen one other time and the only fun footnote to this is one of my heroes scooped me uh, i was trying to buy a jack pierce bust of frankenstein's head yes uh, from spectral motion and i sent a note to mike elizalde the owner of the studio i said hey man what are the chances can i just buy this directly he goes no it's already up and you know, you should be good. Just hit the reserve. You'll be fine. Reserve was 800 bucks. So I was like, oh man, I'm not comfortable with that. I think it's going to go for more than that. So I put it up to like two grand, right? And I got absolutely smoked out at like $7,000. And Guillermo Whoa. del Toro bought it. And I was like, yeah. dude, Mike, you work with them all the time. Why don't you just give them one? Come on. Dude. What are you doing here? Anyway. Um, I haven't had a chance to uh, talk to Garamo about that, but I might. Well, at least you know it's uh, it's being well cared for, right? In his collection. So. I mean, if you're gonna get, if you're gonna get, you know, if you're gonna get, <laughs> get sapped in the skull by someone, if someone's gonna blackjack you, at least it, at least it's Guillermo del Toro, and like, he does have a pretty nice house full of amazing stuff. So that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah but I still, you know, I'm still smarting from it though. Anyway, that's that's the setup for the auction. Um, it's open to anybody with a uh, who signed up for a membership. Uh, there's no pre-qualification in that regard. All you have to do is have a functioning membership to Heritage Auction. All you sign up and give them your details, and you're good to go. You now, go. I can't I can't give any sense at all uh, about what 
the price points are going to be like if people can get in for 25 bucks or they have to come in for a thousand there's no reserves on anything as far as i know at least preliminary so you can say oh i'll bid 50 bucks or whatever pre pre bid 50 bucks um so i can't speak with any uh certainty on that what it'll, does, it'll, be, uh, it'll be notified if it is a uh, reserve if it's a reserve uh auction what john before we before we close out here what's your favorite piece out of the i mean you know it's like it's like asking what's your what's who's your favorite kid right but right. <laughs> well i only have one so she's my favorite um <laughs> If you had, if you could only bid on one, one piece, what would it be? That's a good question. I haven't really given it uh, any thought up until this very moment. I would probably go with, um, only because it was the first thing I did. I did a pass at uh, the Ebon Hawk oh. and, and it, it's seen, I, I, I don't particularly love the design that made it into the game. I don't hate it, kind of neutral. Um, but this was a tramp freighter, the first thing I did. And I sent it to Doug Chang for the, you know, for the, for the, for the, for the check mark, for the well done. And he gave me a well done. I was like, hey, cool. And it's the very first piece I did for the game uh when we were still very very early and we were still working through the design document so we didn't really know the direction we were headed or anything so we we're just kind of doodling out ideas and thumbnailing things and that's the first one that i took to uh a degree of resolution and it looks like egyptian parchment that thing has seen much better days so when someone gets it it's not going to be a snap and like hey look i can put it behind glass i don't touch that thing get archive gloves yeah, I did a I did a ton of them, but the very first one is is pretty rough. Looks like the looks like Declaration of Independence. It's all uh, it's all faded, but that that would probably be the one simply because it was the first time I put pen to paper for for the game. Well, I'll and be sure to uh, put in. I'll be sure to put in my pre bid uh, next week, uh, but everyone else can put their bids again. July eighteenth. July eighteenth. Dot com. Well, again, dot com, people. Yourself a membership, uh, bid and bid often because I'm sure it's going. It's already been viewed what seven or eight thousand times, which means oh, it's getting into circulation already. That's Whoa! Good. It gets, you know. gets a lot uh, of eyes on it. And again, uh, this is the only time this happens. There is no. I'm not with some comic speculator who's got like a warehouse full of shit, and then all of a sudden it's going to be part two and part three. All I have left are some. Uh, Dragon Age and some Jade Empire stuff that if this does well, we'll probably have a Bioware combined, like the artists of Bioware from the Golden Age combined live arts auction, if this one does well. Uh, but that's still up for discussion, of course. And right. it's not up to me to decide if it does well or not. If it gets a bunch of zeros behind it, and I go, whoa, that's a lot. That's pretty good. Um, then yeah, I guess it did well, but I, I want to make sure this work as much as I can. This was the only way I could offer the work to the world so that other people would have a chance to enjoy it in their homes and frame stuff up and have it in their, in their Star Wars caves and so on. So Art and a piece of history. There you go. For real. Doing my best. Doing my best. No Thank you so much for coming on, John. You bet. It was always a blast. pleasure. You guys, you guys are great. I really enjoy spending time with you. And, and <laughs> of course, always. always. Thank fine. you for thank you for coming back. And we hope that uh, you'll you'll. We hope we, we, we need, hope we need to turns out well. So you come. Can... We need you to come back after the auction so that we can talk yeah. how Acolyte finished. We can recap your auction and and uh, yeah. We'll if the auction does it, really well, it. I won't tell anyone. Let them be <laughs> But, but, yeah, but, we'll but, there, but there will be signs. Yeah. I'm, I'm on a yacht. <laughs> John Gallagher. Out, I'm out in international waters avoiding taxes. Yeah. <laughs> John Gallagher, thank you very much for, for stopping by today. Uh, can you let the listeners know where they can find you? Yeah, um, I'm on all the usuals. Uh, just look under my pseudonym, Uncanny Neck. Um, I'm on Twitter, Uncanny Neck 1, Uncanny Neck on IG. Uncanny Neck on Facebook, Uncanny Neck on DeviantArt. Um, I'm easy to find. I usually like to engage in uh, in in chat if uh, 
you know, everybody's being respectful and all of that usual terms and conditions. Star mm -hmm. Wars, I'm always up for having a app about and anything else related to, uh, related to this wild substrate reality that we all share. Happy to have a chat about that too. Awesome. Right on. Thanks again, John. Yeah. I'll talk to yeah. you soon. Yeah. Take yeah, care, everybody. Talk to you soon. Yep. Saturday, June 8th, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Come to the Great Prop Swap at the Albar Shriners Auditorium in Kearney Mesa to see real movie props and replicas, costumers and collectibles, movie celebrities, retail vendors, live DJ, food and fun. $10 admission at the door or get tickets now at thegreatpropswap.com. The only thing it's missing is Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Monster commercials. <laughs> Great yeah. commercial. And we are going to be there also. Uh, we, our table is going to be on the second floor. That's right. Um, so last year for anybody that saw us at prop swap, we had our, a 10 by 10 space, just like everybody else, um, this year. And, and in that space, we were selling, you know, everything from collectibles to, to helmets that had both, were both like raw casts as well as painted ones that we'd done. Um, this year we're going to have a 10 by 10 space that does exactly the same thing. All the same kind of stuff. John's bringing some stuff. I think you'll be able to see in person, um, one of his hell diver suits. We're trying to trying to have oh, it ready. No um, touching. No yeah. touching. Yeah. So that so that you can then order one from from him. You just uh, wear it all day, John. Yeah. Right. Oh, you bug be juice. the mannequin. I think it's on a mannequin. Fresh bug juice. But in addition to the ten by ten for where we're selling stuff, we have another ten by ten immediately next to it. And in that one, we're actually going to set up a little mini studio, where we'll be nice. able to do live interviews of the guests that are there at the prop swap, and uh, should be pretty cool. We've got some we've got some interesting furnishings being put together for the for this event should be a nice little set dad bash lounge yeah exactly yeah. So we'll, be re we'll be recording there and then i believe joe's going to be going live just sporadically throughout the whole day that's what he does that's, that's what, what, I do. what he does yeah i do what i do so it should be fun um and if you guys tickets are ten dollars uh but remember if you go to prop swaps instagram reshare any of their posts and tag us we will send you a free ticket in a helmet no no, 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 not, no not, that. Not, not 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 that nobody promised anything gosh <laughs> in a helmet directly by sitting Bye. the ideas and comments expressed on this show are not necessarily those of the dead <laughs> oh my god oh man man how about that interview with john gallagher that was that was pretty great I mean, yeah, he's he's, he's definitely he's he's got some uh, he's got some point of views. That's for sure. He's got some yep. opinions. Um, Different opinions are good. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's good to have Absolutely. a smoke go around. Different that just proves points. that we all come from different walks of life. We all can like Star Wars. That's right. Yeah. Well, I think that's going to do it for us today, guys. Uh, if you enjoyed listening, feed that algorithm and leave a five star review on your podcast app. Be sure to include that cake emoji when you write that review. Uh, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just subscribe down below and you can be entered to win an Alpha Ignition helmet of your choice. Casted by the Dad Batch and painted by our very own tech.badbatch, Joe Lara. You can follow me at stevie.cakes on Instagram, sometimes on X and threads. Gentlemen, let the listeners know where they can find you, John. Alpha Ignition on the socials. Nice. And Brian? Uh, go to the great, great Prop Swap. I think I just found their Instagram. Yeah, check them out. You guys go there and have a good time. I'll be there in yeah. spirit. And Joe? 7AB at San Diego Comic Con. All of us. All of us. Mm -hmm. All of us. Mm -hmm. And Ramey. All of what everyone else said, the dadbatch.com, Prop Swap, <laughs> San Diego Comic Con. We have a busy summer coming up. Yes. What Basically, you? if you uh, can't find us, what are you even doing on the internet? Do you do bad batch? We're, we're, the, we're, like, yeah. we're everywhere. Hopefully, you find us because uh, we're going to be dead after. So, yeah. Yeah. Black, thank black. you again, everybody, for listening to episode ninety-four of the Dad Batch Podcast. Be sure to tune in next week for episode ninety-five. And until next time, enjoy your spice responsibly.
Boom. Whoo! Music, music turned off. Yeah, he's playing. He hears the music. Speak his brain. No, he'll just add it. He'll add it later. It's easier to drop it in than. Brother. Remember, I go black. Black.